as compliance officer, I got to shut it down. So. So it's the compliance version of the grandmother test. Would, would you say that? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Welcome to Cannabis Matters. I'm Eric Rosen, and I'm here with Gary Seelhorst of Justice Cannabis. Gary, thanks so much for carving out time to be with us today. Absolutely. I'm a, it's a pleasure to be here, Eric. So walk us through your background. You know, how did you come to be in cannabis? And specifically, how did you wind up on the compliance side of the industry? Yeah, so um, so my my career kind of started more on the, the pharmaceutical side. Um, I was a clinical scientist for, for years. I worked on a lot of the uh, sort of the earlier and kind of mid-stage drug trials. I designed a lot of those. And then I was more interested to work maybe more on the transactional side. So they paid for my MBA. Um, and then I, I moved more into sort of corporate compliance and uh, really more like the due diligence, transactions, licensing and M&A and, and a lot of um, that side of it. So I was dealing a lot with FDA um, regarding FDA compliance. So um, so having kind of that background, you know, with a sort of a highly regulated industry, I think resonates well into this industry. After Pfizer, then I, I started working for some startups. Um, and I was working kind of more on the regulatory side because with, with smaller pharmaceutical and medical device companies, you're, a, you're on a pretty strict regulatory path. And um, usually what you're doing is having, um, you know, a series of meetings with the FDA. Um, so you sort of have a, a roadmap and you're hopefully, hopefully ticking off some of these, these check boxes that they've given you on the way to uh, regulatory approval. So. Um, so there's always a compliance component with how you're conducting a lot of your studies and your operations and making sure that that's compliant with a lot of the, the FDA regulations that they've set forth, which have kind of been in place, let's, you know, let's face it for about, you know, 50, 75 years. So it's, it's, it's different in the fact that it, it doesn't change a whole lot. There's ticks here and there that happen, um, but most, yeah, for the most part, it's 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 a lot different from cannabis, <laughs> in that cannabis changes frequently. It just became such a fascinating, interesting industry to me, and that's that's why I was I was all in. Gary, tell us a little bit about Justice Cannabis and sort of where you sit in the space and what differentiates it. So, um, so yeah, so we're in different states. Um, we're vertical in some, uh, retail and others. We originally were Justice Grow, um, and. And we have a lot of folks that really um, have a lot of expertise from the cultivation space. Um, and then we started to pull a lot of folks in from more of the kind of the branding and, and, uh, and extraction space too. So, um, so we have a lot of expertise there. We have um, really good practices in place. And, and a lot of the brands that we're starting to push out now, we're getting a lot of really good feedback. As you're working alongside politicians and government agencies, what are some of the more topical conversations that you find yourself having um, as it relates to uh, widespread legalization? The one I think that sort of looms large that that's talked about, but there's not a whole lot being done right now is interstate commerce. And, and I think people talk about it as though it's just a flip of the switch and, and it's far from that. Um, you know, you've, you've got a lot of these different states and a lot of legislators in those states that have really kind of put a lot of their, you know, their credibility into the industry of cannabis. And so you, then you then have these, these tax revenues that are associated with that. And, you know, that's, you know, it's a lot of their reputation that's on the line. And, and if you're going to disrupt any of that tax revenue, you know, they're going to have a, they're going to have an issue with it. So, um, so it, it's going to be a phased approach when, when that happens, it's, it's going to be, you know, there's probably going to be a few test cases where you have maybe tripartite agreements with three different states, and then you figure out, you know, if it maybe it comes from one state and then it retails in another state, how to basically split up the taxes like that. Um, and then, you know, they might start it out regionally a little bit more and then maybe a, you know, full widespread, uh, you know, federal legalization, but then you'll probably have a federal tax that's um, imposed as well. So. Um, yeah, it's it's not a real easy issue to, to to fix, so to speak. And I think you've got a lot of people that are weighing in on this that um, that that have differing opinions on on how that should happen and differing timelines. More importantly, I think so. Um, I think that's 
one thing that's once they can kind of figure that out, you're going to have a kind of a completely different landscape on, you know, there's probably going to be more regionality as far as cultivation and, and, uh, and then certainly, you know, a lot of different types of, of, of proclivities that the customers will have in different areas as well as we are already seeing. From a collaboration standpoint, you know, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for cannabis brands to lean in on the policy front as it, the industry continues to, to evolve and, and mature? Is it interstate commerce? Is it safe banking? Well, certainly those two. I think those two are big parts of it. Intellectual property is is always kind of a it's a it's a big asset that you can have as a kind of a CPG kind of company. Um, but it's hard to really navigate right now because you know the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office, is a federal agency and it's federally illegal. So what a lot of people I think are doing is trying to put their stake in the sand with them ahead of time and, and then filing um, you know some of these state intellectual property filings as well. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how that's going to finally, you know, work its way out. But um, I think that's, you know, I think early on you saw a lot of these um, uh, sort of cultivators and, and extractors trying to kind of put together these method patents as well. And I think those kind of proved to be probably not as valuable as they, they once thought because all you have to do is just kind of switch one thing up in the protocol. And, and then they're unenforceable. So, um, but I think, you know, once that kind of, you know, finally kind of works its way in, the winners in this in this industry are gonna be the ones that have developed really good, high quality brands. And if you can get some intellectual property around that, those are, those are the people that will win the day. How do you and the team of Justice stay ahead of the curve with respect to future-proofing your strategies around marketing, packaging, the things that are sort of subject to change from a regulation standpoint? Yeah, you, and that's, I think where it really helps to be a part of a lot of these trade groups and you can really start to see where the puck is going, you know, and, and you see trends that are happening and, and then you, you also can kind of work through a lot of the legislators that are out there as well that, that kind of want to see what's, you know, what's best for the industry and um, then, you know, put together bills that are going to help out, you know, with the industry if it's you know, going to be something like, you know, cannabis financing reform or if it's going to be packaging or you know, eventually everything is probably is going to open up more from a from an adult, adult use standpoint so um so you want you want to make sure that your company is going to be nimble enough to to make some of those those switches not only just kind of with your packaging but also your branding um and uh and, and the way you're you're sort of reaching out to a lot of your patients and customers too how does justice think about balancing the right amount of Call it legacy cannabis acumen and you know, outside traditional CPG acumen to make sure that you have the right mix uh, for the for the organization at any given time. There's a couple of different ways I can answer that question too because you know you've got operators that um, that really have a have a good understanding of not only just the sort of the operations of cultivation and manufacturing, um, it, but looking at a lot of the genetics and how the genetics kind of play a role and how you set up you know your genetics locker and, and the different brands. And the products that you're putting out um, and a lot of those genetics I mean let's face it kind of come from that that legacy market um, you see a lot of you know cross hybridization as well um, and I, I think as a lot of the, these folks start to embrace the legal market um, you know you, you start to pull them in um, after you know a certain amount of, of correspondence and and, uh, and trust that you have with those folks. And I honestly, I, I still think a lot of those those genetics are, are going across state lines and you know, that, that happens. Um, and some of the states are, you know, are clamping down on it, but I think some of them also kind of look the other way too. You mentioned a healthy balance. Um, it's really gonna be different for, for every company based on really what their comfort level is with the product mix that they have and maybe, um, you know, looking at, so you know, a lot of the, the states are now starting to allow for a certain time period where you can bring in some of those genetics. Um, if, you, if you're, you know, brand new and you're just starting your cultivation operations, they'll give you a 30 day window. We can transfer over state lines. Pennsylvania has that. We, we, we took advantage of that, certainly. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we're, we're dealing with you know, some of these, these operators that are, you know, that are straight out of the legacy market, um, just because they have got such great stuff. 
Um, but you know, it's all compliant, exactly what we're doing, um, and, and everything's tracked and traced once it comes to us. So, um, so we're you know we're happy to um, you know to indulge everything that we think is what's best for the industry. Um, and and if we have any questions about it, you know, we'll go straight to the regulators and say, hey, look. Um, this is something that we're considering. What do you guys think about it? Um, you know, and, and if you've built up that, you know, that level of trust with the regulators, they'll answer you. They'll they'll be timely with a lot of their communication with you because they understand that there is there is that need. You know? So um, I think what's really what's most important is just understanding how much of that you really want to incorporate into your company's brand as well. Because I think some some legal companies still kind of do lean into a little bit of that legacy feel, especially in California, Oregon, you know, Washington, some of those folks. Um, and then, and others, I think, want to maintain a much different feel and, and appeal according to that, that sort of, that disposition. What advice would you give to new brands that are entering the space today and tomorrow? Yeah, so, um, so definitely come in with, um, with an ample amount of capital. And I know that's not an easy ask right now, but you don't, you know, I think folks that come in thinking that they'll bootstrap, um, you know, I think that's, it's fair if, if you have, uh, you know, a decent amount of, of capital to start with and you've really streamlined your operations from the beginning. Um, but you definitely want to have some reserves because you're you're gonna get, you're gonna get hit in the mouth as, as as Mike Tyson, the philosopher Mike Tyson says, um, you know, if you, you know, it's, it's like you come in with a plan, everyone's got a plan until you get hit in the mouth. So in, in cannabis, you get hit in the mouth a lot. Um, and it's, you know, there's supply issues, there's people not paying you back, there's, you know, there's banking issues and, you know, there's regulations changing all the time. And and if, if you're not, you have to think to yourself, if you're not okay being in a place that there's you know there's a lot of uncertainty it's probably not the best business for you um and that starts with capital it makes sure that you know your your capital requirements are you know are fairly locked in this industry moves incredibly quickly mm -hmm. so while no one has a crystal ball if you fast forward three years or five years what does the space look like today, uh, then compared to today i've been asked that a lot over the last four years and and i wouldn't have said you know, what I, like four years ago, how it was going to be right now. Um, you know, and, and, and really kind of, you kind of have a sort of a near term and a sort of a longer term view of it too. I think, you know, if, if you if we could see something, you know, where they really have like a, like a comprehensive cannabis finance reform, that's really going to open things a lot in the industry. Um, and that's, you know, sort of better access to capital, even short term loans. Um, you know, the 280 decoupling, I think it's gonna have a really big effect. And then, you know, credit card transactions, everything else, I think you get a, a much different look of, of the industry, um, you know, post federal legalization. So if you go to sort of three years, I still don't think we probably have federal legalization, but we have other singles that we've probably gotten along the way. The long term, is really kind of what we saw in the beginning when we thought federal legalization was was imminent. Is you're going to start to see a lot of these larger, larger uh, you know CBG companies that are going to probably take over. Um, but I think they're all kind of sitting on the sideline right now, sort of doing a wait and see and, and understanding. I think you know when they were first coming in and starting to do some of these transactions, I just don't think they had any idea what was coming forward. They thought they, they thought it was just going to be another transaction like they're accustomed to and then they understood it's a whole different ball of wax gary it's an absolute pleasure to have had you on the on the program today it's always yeah. a pleasure to connect and uh here's to all of your you know ongoing success in the months and uh, months and years to come absolutely it's uh great back at you i mean it's, it's always great to talk to you you're a great mind in in the industry as well and, and i you know I, I like what you're doing with this platform so i'm, I'm really happy to be a part of it we'll support it however i, I can in the future too